So this is 1.5, the second part of it, and we're going to cover the intermediate value theorem. So I'm going to start off by writing the theorem. Okay, so before I um, explain this, I'm going to actually draw it first. So just reiterating, it, it says basically if f is continuous on this interval, and the interval is an x interval, this is our x, this is our y, and k is any number between f of a and f of b, I'll write that out in a second, inclusive, it could, it could be including one of them, then there is at least one number x in the interval, in this interval, such that f of x equals k. So to write that out and draw it, so given f is continuous and k is a number in between the y values, so it's somewhere here. K is in between, including, that's what inclusive is, between f of a and f of b. Without loss of generality, f of b could be first, which will be my next example. So k is in between there. So we're going to draw k. It doesn't have to be exactly in the middle, just somewhere in between. So it hits the graph somewhere there and then goes down. So if this is what's given. If there's a k in between f of a and f of b, and, and we have a continuous graph, then there exists an x in the interval a, b. It's inside a, b. So there's our x. It's inside there, such that f of x is equal to k. So the function, the output is f of x, and it's equal to k. That's what this says. It's interesting, and, and with it being continuous, and you draw it out, it kind of seems obvious, so I'm not going to prove it, but the result is more interesting and more useful. So if we have continuous, So a result of it is if the y values, the endpoints of the y values on this interval, f of a and f of b, if they are opposite signs, one's positive, one's negative. So if one's positive and one's negative, well then zero is in between them. So zero is our k. Let's draw that out. So let's say f of a is positive. Here's a point on the graph, and f of b is negative. So that's given. They have opposite signs. Well, you can see being continuous is a critical part of this theorem. It must be continuous, because if it's continuous, we've got to connect those dots without lifting our pen, because that's the definition of continuous. There's no holes, no gaps, no jumps. So to do that, it doesn't matter where it's going, it's got to... This is 0, which is our k. Our k is 0. And this is x. We can see f of x is equal to 0. There's a 0 in between a and b if it's continuous and the y values of the endpoints of a, b are different signs. Again, clearly, this intermediate value theorem helps us find zeros of functions. So do be careful. It does just tell us the existence of a root and not the solution itself, not the root itself. But we could use it to approximate the solution, as you'll see on my second example. So we want to show x to the third plus 3x equals 2 on the interval 0, 1 someplace. So it doesn't look like we have a function, but if we take and we get zero on one side, well, then this could be our function because we want to show f of x equals zero. So we can use intermediate value theorem to do that. 
So we, now that we have a function, our first step is to show f of x is continuous. Well, f of x, we can see here it's a polynomial, which implies that it's continuous. Therefore, check. That's our first condition. Our second condition is that the endpoints have different signs. So let's find it. Let's find f of 0, and then we'll find f of 1. So they do have opposite signs. So since it has both conditions, therefore, that's my therefore symbol. That's my there exists a symbol. And that's the end. We proved it. OK, so we want to work this out. And it gives us a hint. So we want to approximate square root of 10 to two decimal places. Now, even though the intermediate value theorem only tells us the existence of a zero, it's possible to use the process several times to get closer and closer to it. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If I have a graph, and let's say I have A and B, and we can see here that there's a zero. So what we can do, once we have opposite signs, we can take the average of A and B. And then we'll figure out that that value is negative, and we have a new interval. This is our new interval. We have opposite signs. So we'll take the average. Let's say the average is here. You can see here that's positive. So now we have a new interval. And we can see we're getting closer and closer by this process. It's exactly what we're going to do. OK, so let's find the polynomial that's continuous that has that as a root. So if, you're, if you can't think of it off the top of your head, think of a linear and we get x equals square root of 10 as our solution, we can square both sides and then make a polynomial out of that. So, so that's going to be my function that has the square root of 10. We can see square root of 10 times square root of 10 is 10 minus 10 is a solution. So there's our polynomial. And now we need to find an interval with the square root of 10 inside an interval. We want whole numbers. So let's find two whole numbers that square root of 10 is in between. How about the square root of 9 and the square root of 16? Because it's pretty obvious. So this is 3, square root of 10, and that's 4. So square root of 10 is in between 3 and 4. Let's find f of 3 and f of 4. And they are clearly opposite signs. So we can see by the intermediate value theorem that there's a root in between 3 and 4. So our picture So what we're going to do now is take the average of 3 and 4. And I'm going to use a table so that we can follow it a little bit cleaner. So we found 3 to be minus 1. We found 4 to be 6. And since these are opposite, so clearly 3.5 is the av. We take average, half of the sum, 4 plus 3. So now we um, plug in 3.5, again, our function minus 10. We use our calculator. And now we have a new interval. We have 3 and 3.5. Let me highlight that. So we take the average of those two, plug it into the function, and now we have a new interval. Here is positive, so we're still using that negative. So now we find the average of 3 and 3.25. Plug it in. You just hit your square button of minus 10. OK, so now we have a negative. And so we use the previous answer and this. Again, the outputs of those functions are positive and negative. So we take the average of those two. We add them up and divide by two. Square it, subtract 10. OK, so now 
Again, you have to use the new one and the one that's negative. So we take off the one that's positive. So now we're going to take the average of those two. So we know we want it to the nearest to two decimal places. We want it to the nearest two decimal places, which means until they stop changing, <laughs> those two decimal places, we can see they stop changing. We're still kind of far apart. We have to keep going. I think we'll know when to stop. So we take the average of those two. So we're gonna use this one and the one that's negative up there, since that one's positive. So we'll use this and this, the two that are opposite. <laughs> Okay, so our new two, so we're going to use the positive and the negative. Take the average again of the x values. So you do notice these numbers are getting smaller, well, almost, because we're getting closer to the zero. So it's working. So now we're using these two because they're opposites. So we are getting closer. This is one seven, one six, one five. We're almost there. So we could do it one more time, but I do believe we found our answer since we got one six twice. We do it one more time, we use these two. So it's clearly, we don't even need to do it one more time. Somewhere in between there. Somewhere in between there. So we found it accurate to two decimal places. If you use your calculator, yeah, we're, we're, somewhere in between there. That's it for today. Thanks.